So we're coming to the last of our Northern Saints and probably the most controversial, uh, which is St. Wilfred. Now, Wilfred was a great man, indeed, and mine, and very much, but he was cut from a different kind of cloth to the other saints that we've talked about. Uh, I guess you could see he's the anti-Cuthbert. Whereas Cuthbert and Aidan really espoused the beliefs of the Celtic Church. They were humble, they despised wealth and comfort, uh, and they tried to lead by example. Uh, Wilfred was a real really embodied what we kind of imagine a medieval bishop to be. He was a prince of the church. He loved opulence and luxury, uh, and he traveled in great pomp, uh, so much so that he rivaled the king, it was said, with the size and glamour of his retinue. Uh, Wilfred was born in Northumbria, and he started his, his church career initially on Linda's farm, but he soon went across the continent to Gaul, and then to Rome, where he came to adopt the orthodox practices of the Roman Catholic Church, as, of course, as opposed to the Irish uh, liturgical uh, system that was used in Northumbria. And after a while, he came home and was appointed as the personal priest to King Os Oswy's son, Alcrith, who thought much of him. And after a while, after the death of Aidan, Oswy decided that this issue, this imbalance between the teachings of the Celtic Church and the rest of the Roman Catholic world, were going to have to be addressed. So he called for a, a synod to be held, a sort of church conference. And this was held at St. Hill's Monastery at Whitby. Now, Aidan's successor as Bishop of Lindisfarne was not Cuthbert. Uh, to begin with, it was a man called Colin, who was we held in high regard. Uh, Cuthbert wasn't at this synod, he was too busy doing what Cuthbert does, uh, wandering the wilderness, battling demons, saving souls. Uh, Cuthbert was far too uh, much of a maverick to attend a, a mere church conference, but Wilfred was there, and he was there representing the Roman Catholic party, which was led by Agilbert, the Bishop of the West Saxons. Now, Agilbert was a Frank, he was from Gaul, and he wasn't entirely comfortable speaking English, certainly not in a debate of this importance. So he asked Wilfred to be the chief spokesman for the Roman Catholic party. So it was Wilfred versus Coleman debating this issue in front of Oswy the King as arbiter. Uh, Coleman was supported by Hild. Wilfred, however, was such uh, a big personality, a forceful character, that he didn't need anyone really to back him up. He could handle the debate on his own. And he spoke very eloquently, but quite haughtily. He described Coleman and the Irish monks as, as fools, as ignorant, uh, who despised the correct practices that were followed in the rest of the Christian world. And although Coleman responded as best he could, saying that they followed the teachings of the Apostle John and, and St. Columba, who he felt was a very holy man, who he would be proud to imitate for the rest of his life, he had no answer when Wilfred responded that his teachings, his system of celebrating Easter, uh, the system that was followed throughout the rest of the Christian world, was based on the teachings of St. Peter, uh, the gatekeeper to the doors of heaven. And that carried great weight with King Oswy, who decided that from then on, Northumbria would follow uh, the more typical Roman practices and abandon the uh, liturgical practices of the Celtic Church, including the tonsure, which was a crown in the Roman Catholic Church, but was front to back in Celtic Christianity, and of course they would celebrate Easter in the usual way. Uh, this was Wilfred's greatest moment of success, and shortly afterwards, Orkfrith, Oswy's son, named him Bishop of Northumbria. So not just Bishop of Lindisfarne in New York, but all of Northumbria. And Wilfred felt that there was no one in Britain who was worthy enough to uh, 
install him in his new role, so he went to Gaul uh, to be ordained as a bishop. But unfortunately for Wilfred, his, his hubris, his arrogance got ahead of him on this occasion, because Alcliffe rose up in rebellion against his father and disappears from the scene. Uh, we don't know what happened to him, be it is curiously silenced by the court for anything good. And this meant that Wilfred was without a bishopric. Uh, Oswe installed someone else, someone a bit more congenial to his tastes. And although Theodore of Tarsus, the Archbishop of Canterbury, eventually restored Wilfred to his bishopric, he felt it was too large that one person shouldn't have a diocese that covered half of England. Wilfred, of course, disagreed. He thought it was entirely appropriate for him to be in charge of so much land, but uh, he was overruled and he had to accept uh, a much reduced diocese. But he was again expelled from Northumbria by Oswe's successor, Edgefrith. And although again, after Edgefrith died, Wilfred was able to return, the next king of Northumbria, Aldfrith, a much milder character, still managed to fall out with Wilfred, who was again kicked out of the country. And it says something about the rulers of Northumbria that they had come to believe bishops and holy men and women should be more like the, uh, the Irish saints who were discussed, Aidan um, and Cuthbert, humble men, ascetic, despising wealth, and not as overbearing and haughty and difficult and, and grasping as Wilfred was. Wilfred, uh, undeterred, went down south. He went to the kingdom of the S South Saxons, uh, Sussex where he established a bishopric at Selsey. And this, this is interesting because the South Saxons had never been converted to Christianity. They were the one uh, tribal kingdom in southern England that had resisted so far uh, the encroaches of the, the Christian church. But they had never encountered a Wilfred before. And Wilfred browbeat them and certainly made a, and eventually persuaded the king and all of his followers to accept the Roman Catholic Church. So after success at the Synod of Whitby, this was Wilfred's other great uh, achievement, uh, ensuring the conversion of the Kingdom of Sussex. Eventually, Wilfred was able to return to Northumbria, where he took up his bishopric at Ripon, uh, and it was there that he died. Uh, one of his followers, Stephen of Ripon, wrote uh, a very positive biography of Wilfred shortly afterwards. And some say that Bede's ecclesiastical history was written in response to this, uh, where although Wilfred's achievements are acknowledged, more difficult aspects of his personality are too, and his accomplishments are put into context with everyone else in Northumbria and Britain and Ireland at that time. But a fascinating figure and well worthy of further study.